The Let's Read podcast is sponsored by GT Arcade, the Internet's premier platform for awesome in-browser and mobile games. When I'm not reading spooky stories, this is one of the best hubs for browser and mobile games, including great games like Rangers of Oblivion, Era of Celestials, Legacy of Discord, League of Angels, and many more. All games have been featured on Google Play and Facebook. It's honestly a miracle that I'm able to take some time away from the amazing games on GT Arcade in order to finish this video. Check out the link in the description to claim your $10 GT Arcade gift pack today, and stay tuned after this video to find out more. If you want to jump right into these awesome games, head over to gtarcade.com and create an account. The link is in the description. And if that wasn't enough, we are giving away 10 $100 Amazon gift cards. Check out the hashtag GTArcade topic discussion in the description to find out how you can enter and win. Thanks for watching, and enjoy these spooky stories. This is something that was super traumatic for me but it was never discussed again in my household. I was talking with my mom about it the other night and she still didn't say much. Thought I would share my thoughts with you all. When I was 13, I got a Dell desktop for school. The internet was fairly new for me back in 2003. AOL and MySpace, Yahoo Messenger, AOL chat rooms, 16 female Cali. Anyone? AOL chat rooms was where I went. I was a shy, overweight kid back then, still shy to this day. But online? Online I could be anyone. I could say anything. It was amazing. I discovered so many things when I got to the internet. If I could be anyone, so could someone else. Thus, how I met one 27-year-old man. One night I logged on. The AOL dial-up sound still makes me feel uneasy. I was sitting in my cold, dark kitchen. The computer was here so I could be monitored. It was just me and my mom, though, and she was always working. No one ever really monitored me. Plus, she had no idea how to use a computer, so I got away with a lot. I was bored, so I hopped into an AOL chat room. Lurked for a bit, then... 15-year-old female here. I was really 13, but saying I was 15 made me feel so much more mature private message incoming. Hey, my name is Rob. Where are you from? And that's how it started. I told him where I was from, that I was in high school, which wasn't a lie. My school was from grades 7 to 12. You? 19-year-old male, New York. Oh man, was it cool to be talking to an older guy. And boy, was he cute. Honestly, I don't really remember much. Maybe I blanked it out. Maybe my memory is just short. I do remember emails back and forth. The occasional phone call. I remember finding out he was talking to another girl and I wanted to break things off. But he begged and pleaded until I caved. Then the... Let's meet. I was nervous. He had never asked for a pic. Had never really asked for much from me. Just the emails back and forth. A phone call a day, but somehow he made me feel safe, made me feel wanted, cared for. He drove from New York to West Virginia one day. My mom worked right beside my house, so he parked about a quarter mile away and took the back alley to enter my house. My friend was with me when he showed up, but was scared when she'd seen him and ran out the back door. I maybe should have taken a hint from that, but I just stood on the back porch with my head down was given a hug as he led me inside. Not five minutes after being there, sitting on the couch, did he move things further. Then further, even into my bedroom. I won't get into the details on what happened next. I assume most can guess. After that, he left, with instructions to get in his car after I got off the school bus and we'll go on a date. I had no idea where he was staying. I lived extremely far in the country, an hour's drive from the closest hotel. The next day I get ready for school, ride the bus for the 45 minute drive, 
and as soon as I hop off in the school parking lot, I get directed into his car. No one noticed. No one said anything. We drive around. Never go on a date. He just finds different places to park so that he can use me. I notice a photo of another young girl, 15 or 16, in the visor of his car. Question him. Believe when he tells me it's his cousin. Believe when I question why his hairline is receding so much. Believe him when he tells me I can't see his driver's license because he left it in the hotel. Believe him when he said he loved me. I get dropped back off at school. Super sad that he was going back home, with promises he will call. Again, everything feels very fuzzy. I can't remember many emotions from this time. I do remember that a few days later my mom says she found out I skipped school with a man, that I was never to see him again, and that was that. I do remember sending an email. I do remember a late night phone call. I do remember saying I wish I could just live with you. I remember him suggesting to come get me. I remember saying okay. Days later, by the time he made the drive again, I was feeling iffy about leaving my mom. I loved her after all. I didn't think things through. I didn't put much thought into anything really. Packed a few clothes in a suitcase. Forgot all underwear. This is one of my sharpest memories. I felt bad that he drove eight hours to get to me, so I left in the middle of the night. Got in the car to him and his cousin. He got in the back seat with me. Proceeded to do things to me while his cousin drove, then get back in the front seat. This happened a few times between my home and his. The drive took forever. I had nothing to drink, was offered nothing when they got something. They stopped a nap at a rest stop and I attempted to collect call my mom, which was disabled on our phone. I dug around for some change to get something to drink but couldn't afford anything in the convenience store, so I drank out of the truck stop sink. Hours later, we park a block away from his house while he runs to get something. I am sitting in the back seat, waking up from a nap when around eight or so men and women in black suits surround the car, screaming for us to get out with our hands up. My first thought was, first ten minutes in New York and I'm already being robbed. I'm terrified. I get out and a man pulls me over to the curb while the other officers force his cousin on the ground. All the while, they're asking my name and age telling me to tell his cousin my age. I am put in the back of an unmarked car, driven to the NYPD, past reporters, cameras, news trucks. Snuck into the back of the station, where I see Rob in handcuffs for the last time. And for the in-love 14-year-old me, this is devastating. I am taken into a room and questioned for hours. I am then taken to the hospital, then a hotel where a nice woman brings me Taco Bell and stays with me as I fall asleep. The next day, two FBI officers escort me home on a plane. Where I get off and where I am greeted by police officers, my mother, and a horde of news reporters. I later found out that when my mom reported me missing, the police didn't want to do much. They didn't even take the picture of me. She had his license plate number. She remembers seeing his car parked by the road that first meeting. She took notes since it was an out-of-state car. Thanks for being vigilant. I do find this is the only reason I am alive today. The police said that they would look into it, but that wasn't enough for my mom. She contacted a family friend who in turn contacted the governor of West Virginia, who in turn made the police look further into it. After they ran the license number, looked into the man, found out who he was. That was when they issued an Amber Alert, noting that I was in extreme danger. My cousin told my mom that he looked at Rob's rap sheet and it was a mile long, but wouldn't tell my mother what was on it, for fear of scaring her more. I never went to court, I never went to any hearings, but I did fall into a horrible depression. My friend's parents wouldn't let them hang out with me. People spray-painted terrible slurs on my locker at school. I had no friends, but most of all I thought a man was in prison for loving me. When I learned he got sentenced to 10 years in prison, which he served every year of, I became deeply troubled. I was in and out of the mental hospital for self-harm for years on a slew of depression medications. Psychiatrists never talked to me about anything, 
I had to process it all myself. My teenage years were better though. I transferred schools, made best friends, graduated. But still in the back of my mind I felt that I was the reason a man lost 10 years of his life. Until I was told he was let out of prison. A couple of years after he was out I contacted him on Facebook. At the time I was around 24 or 25. He told me that if I ever contacted him again, he would end both me and my mother, that he still knows where I live. I had no idea what he was planning on doing with me. My mom still says selling me to a trafficker. I was told that he had other girls my age he was talking to. Some good things happened because of my kidnappings. Schools all over my state started internet safety education classes. Kids were taught safety. Parents were taught how to keep kids safe. No other girls were taken by this man. So, to the man who ruined so many years of my life, I am 29 now. I am happy, healthy, and I have zero remorse that you are now listed as a level 3 offender and that you were in prison for so many years. I was 16 at the time, and I rode the public bus to and from school. This particular day, I had done some special effects makeup before the end of my classes, so I had fake blood running down my face, and I couldn't be bothered to take it off before leaving school. Now, I knew I was boarding my bus. People would stare or ask questions, so I wasn't surprised when this man, who looked to be in his mid-thirties, started asking about the makeup. The conversation was normal at first, just the usual... Oh wow, did you do that yourself? Kind of stuff. I answered the questions as I normally would and expected the conversation to be done and over with. Boy, was I wrong. This man, he mentioned his name was Joe, started steering the conversation into strange territory, asking me if I had a boyfriend, to which I lied and said I did. He then proceeded to ask if my boyfriend liked the makeup and if I was on my way to see him now. I again lied and said he likes the makeup and yes, I'm going to see it, trying to get Joe to believe someone was expecting me. The conversation died down for a bit until we said this, You know, you remind me a lot of my sister. He said with a grin. I just smiled in response, not really knowing what to say. After not hearing anything from me, Joe continued, My sister was kind of an idiot. She was always lying about me to our parents. I had fantasies about breaking her jaw. Now at this point, I was terrified. My bus stop was still another 30 minutes away and I just wanted to be out of that situation. Seeing that what he said made me uncomfortable, he switched the subject, telling me about where he worked and what he does. I just nodded along to what he was saying, remaining silent the entire time. Closer to my bus stop, he says to me, Why don't you come to my house? I have a freezer full of pizza and ice cream. Maybe we can hang out for a while. To which I politely declined, saying my boyfriend was expecting me. Finally, I get to my bus stop and quickly get off the bus, speed walking all the way home, all the while calling a friend to inform them of what happened. Things were fine for a bit after that, I switched my bus route so I wouldn't run into him again, but one afternoon I had to go to a store that was on my old route. I was nervous about getting on that bus again, but was happy when I didn't see Joe. I did my shopping and as I was leaving the store, I saw Joe, standing out by the doors, staring at me. The second I was out of the doors, he walked over to me, a grin on his face, and wrapped his arms around me. I pulled away from him, telling him I was very busy and had to go. He then asked, Well, what are you doing? I have time, I can tag along. I was very persistent, saying I really couldn't, I had to go, and I walked away, heading into a neighboring store that I knew would be busy. Sure enough, Joe followed. I ignored him as I made my way down a heavily populated makeup aisle, keeping my attention on some cheap lipsticks in the hopes that he'd get the hint and leave me alone. I was wrong. Joe reached over my shoulder, grabbing a red lipstick as he leaned in close and whispered, The color would look gorgeous on you. 
I can't wait to see you wearing it. He then placed the lipstick in my basket and walked away, leaving the store. I remained in the store for about 20 minutes after he left, afraid to leave and make the walk home. After I mustered up the courage, I put the lipstick back, put away the basket, and called a friend to stay on the line with me until I made it home. Now, I don't know if he followed me home or not, but I can say that after that day, the motion detector porch lights started coming on at night and I started hearing knocks at my bedroom window. Thankfully, I moved shortly after and haven't seen Joe since. I was about 13 when my family went on our annual trip to Poland to visit family. My mother and father both come from a small rural village about two to three hours away from Warsaw. It's an idyllic little place that is surrounded by lush forests and wheat fields. Life is different there. Everyone is very carefree and relaxed. Being the small place it is, everyone knows one another since everyone essentially lives on the same street. I had made a bit of a reputation for myself, being known as the American girl who visits in the summers so whenever we would arrive, the whole village would know. I loved the attention. All the kids wanted to play, and adults doted on me. One of the townspeople I saw most frequently was Tomek. Tomek was a funny guy in his upper 20s who would work in the village deli store. He would always give me extra meat anytime my grandparents would send me out to pick food up or offer to show me inside the kitchen. I never took him up on that offer, the idea of seeing how my meat was made was too much for my 13-year-old mind. Though I didn't know it at the time, Tomek had the reputation of being the town lunatic. He wasn't a stranger to the police force nor the villagers as he was a bit of a petty thief. My grandparents told me when I got older that my grandfather had not once but twice caught him trying the doors of his shed and then excusing himself when caught as drunk and unsure where he was. Despite this, I had never had a reason to fear or avoid him. The village had a tradition called Gra Odwagi, which translates to the game of courage that would fall in between the dates of our visits. On this day, the village children would be set into teams and then given items to find that were hidden around the woods and or village perimeters. The event lasted all day and the group that had the most found items would win a prize. The courage part of the game would be trying to attain the golden item, which would be in the woods and guarded by a few adults armed with water sprayers and water guns. The only way to get the golden item was to avoid being sprayed with water. If all members of a team were hit, then the team would lose the chance to attain it. My team consisted of my four friends, Eva, Eric, Bartek, and Powell. Our strategy was to get as many of the items around town and then try our luck at the golden object when it got darker in order to be harder to spot. We got a lot of the items throughout the day and worked up a good sweat after racing against the other children. Around 7pm we had attained 12 items that were ready to try our luck at the golden item. We had heard from the other children that the adults were being relentless guarding the object with ferocity. The wooden area that was the destination, as the golden item area was behind Eric's house. Therefore, he took the lead in devising the plan. Our plan was that we were going to split up into two teams. Eric, Eva, Bartek were meant to grab the adults' attention and drive them away as far as possible while Powell and I would sneak in and grab the item. Feeling confident, we headed into the forest as the sun was slipping from the sky. We followed the dirt path for about five minutes and then stepped off it, following Eric as he navigated through the shrubbery with ease. He stopped us as we reached a thick clump of bushes. Putting a finger to his lips, he motioned for us to look through the gaps in the shrubbery and see the adults. It was dark now, so it was hard to see who was actually guarding the items, but we could make out four shapes huddled together, chatting softly. Without hesitation, we moved into our plan of action. Our three friends navigated around and disappeared from our sight, only for us to hear their laughs and the voices of adults yelling to get them. 
pal and I watched as the adults raced after our friends, all abandoning the area they had stood around. I remember glancing around and getting ready to jump out of the bushes when I felt Powell's arm on my shoulder and saw him make a shushing sound. They might not all be gone. Wait a bit, he urged. We sat quietly listening intently for any sounds. Then it happened, the slightest sound of something moving on the other side of the clearing. We couldn't make out who or what it was so we stayed quiet, peering through the gaps of the shrubbery. Powell saw it first. He pointed out what looked like a dark figure crouching behind a tree closest to the clearing. We watched as the figure moved tree to tree, never steeping out from behind it, just simply observing. Just as I was about to suggest that one of us should cause a distraction, we hear a yelp and turn to see another team approaching, clearly happy that there seemed to be no one around where the golden item should be. We watched as this small group of two raced around the clearing but didn't pick anything up. I kept waiting for the adult to step out and spray the kids, but the figure remained crouched, half visible behind the trees. One of the girls approached the area the adult was, but she was busy looking up at the tree, musing to her partner that maybe the object was put on a branch. We watched as she began pulling herself up the lowest branch, and I remember the way my stomach dropped when... All of a sudden we saw the adult shoot out from behind the tree, grab her leg, and start pulling her into the darkness of the forest. Her partner ran off screaming, leaving me and Pau unsure what to do. We watched frozen with horror as the adult began covering the girl's mouth in some attempt to silence her. Before either one of us could do anything, all of a sudden Tomek came running up the path and threw himself onto the man. Pal shot out to help Tomek while I ran back to call for help. When I reached the backyard, that was the destination spot for the end of the game. I was screaming uncontrollably in a mix of words that took me a few attempts to get out that help was needed. A large group of men raced towards the forest while I hid in my mother's arms, awaiting to see everyone arrive back safely. My friends, Eric, Eva, and Bartek, approached me cautiously and asked what happened and why Powell and I hadn't come back. It had turned out that after Eva, Bartek, and Eric had distracted the adults and drove them away, the adults had decided to end the time to get the gold item. They had assumed that everyone had a chance to try to get it and didn't want the kids wandering the forest after dark. One of the adults had already pocketed the item when they chased our group back towards the main backyard. My team had assumed that we would see that there was nothing there and then returned as well, which is why they didn't come looking for us. As I retold what happened, everyone in the backyard listened to me with wide eyes. About ten minutes passed and we saw the group of men coming back, Powell walking aside his father and the girl who had been attacked in the arms of her assumed father. As they all approached, I asked Powell what had happened. As the parents gathered and talked in hushed voices, Powell described to us how Tomac had beat the guy bloody but let him escape when he turned away, surprised by the men that had arrived to help. He mentioned that a few men were still out scouting the forest land for the guy. I then asked the remainder of my friends why help was not sent earlier by the girl's partner that had run away screaming. Everyone had looked at me with blank faces and the sudden realization hit me hard. The next events became a blur. It's a mix of me racing to my parents with my friends and asking about the girl, a frenzy of people calling out her name and begging her to come out, a whirlwind of everyone rushing to get their kids inside, and mayhem, adults swarming together to go search the woods again and call the police. It's been eight years now, and she hasn't been found. Tomek was one of the main suspects, believed to be part of a two-man kidnapping operation, but backed out when he saw that too much attention was brought to the event. I'm not sure whatever happened to him, but I can't help but feel guilty that I didn't do anything to help either of those girls. I saw the girl run away. Powell and I were the last to see her. Sometimes when I see a child with braided hair I get thrown back to that night, and I can still see her braids swirling around as her figure disappeared from sight.
Six years ago this fall, my sister and I were living with our grandparents. I had just started seeing my now wife and she spent a lot of time at the house with me too. So we were three young, attractive women all congregating in one place on a regular basis. We attracted some attention. My grandparents' house is in a small midwestern town. It's located in a quiet neighborhood, just a block off from a country highway. It has a long driveway, a big open lot on one side, and a tree line on the other side. It also has a really big backyard that connects to several other backyards in the neighborhood. The first time I saw the man, my wife and I had been out gravel traveling and talking about everything under the sun. She was planning to go home that night, so she parked across the street from my grandparents' house so that we could finish our conversation before she dropped me off. I suddenly felt this feeling like I was being watched. I thought I was just being paranoid because we had been talking about creepy things, so I tried to shrug it off. Right before I got out of the car, I noticed the silhouette of a man standing in the tree line on the side of my grandparents' house. It was right around dusk, so I couldn't see him well enough to get a description of him, but I could tell he was there. I told my now wife, and she told me not to get out. We sat there for a while, watching. She had tinted windows. He couldn't see us, but the man didn't move. After what felt like a really long time... I told her I was going to make a run for it. I could see my grandpa sitting in his chair by the kitchen window, so I was sure I'd be fine. I took a deep breath, jumped out of the car, and sprinted. I turned and locked the door as soon as I stepped in the front door, and grandpa could tell I was spooked. I told him what I'd seen, and that I thought we should call the cops. He told me that my friend Kenny had been over while I was out. He was drunk, and he was probably taking a leak in the trees before he walked through the backyard home. I still felt shaken, but that reassured me a little bit. Fast forward, it's been about three days. My sister was at her boyfriend's, my love was at her place, and it's about one in the morning, so my grandparents were asleep. I was up reading articles on my laptop and decided it was time to go to bed. There's a big, beautiful picture window in the living room that looks over the driveway. It only has small lace curtains that are completely sheer. I stood up across the living room and saw... something. I jumped back and peered around the window frame for a closer look. There was a silhouette of a man standing at the end of my driveway. He was tall, well built, and was wearing a baseball cap, and seemed like he was looking right into the big window. I started to panic. My chair was visible from the window. How long had he been watching me? I ran to check that the garage door and front door were locked and ran down the hallway to knock on my grandparents' door. I heard my grandma say, come in. I told her what I saw and she woke up my grandpa. He walked out to the living room with me, but no one was there. My grandparents were popular in the community because they were landlords and they helped people that were down on their luck. He told me that it might have been Judd, one of their renters who borrowed a truck from them a couple of months back. He said I should go to bed and not worry about it. I went to bed feeling really uneasy but trying hard to convince myself that my grandpa was right. I mean, the silhouette I saw would kind of fit for Judd. The next sighting was the very next night. My love was still at her place, my sister and grandparents were in bed, and I was sitting in my chair reading creepy Reddit stories. All of a sudden, I heard movement in the garage. The garage is connected to the house and shares a wall with the living room. I tried to convince myself that I was hearing things, that I was paranoid, or maybe it was an animal. Then, I heard movement again, and a faint cough. I bolted up from the chair, checked the garage door lock, and ran screaming for my grandpa. He jumped up from bed, grabbed his gun, and went to check it out. There was no one there. Nothing appeared to have been disturbed. Grandpa sternly told me I needed to start going to bed at night instead of staying up and reading scary stories. He did lock the doors from the garage to the outside, though. I went to bed, firmly convinced that there had been someone in the garage. The next morning, I went to the basement to get my sister up. I asked her if she had noticed anything weird at the house the last few days. She told me she thought she heard some weird noises outside her window a couple of nights before, 
and that her dog had growled. Her dog never growled, she explained to me, and she was scared. But we lived in such a small, sleepy, midwestern town. Bad things don't happen here. So she tried to convince herself that a dog was overreacting to something, probably a squirrel. I told her about the last four days and she was shocked. We told Grandma and Grandpa, but they were convinced that it was a coincidence. Grandpa had checked himself twice after all. My sister and I agreed that we would keep watch for any weird things. Three more nights later and my wife came to stay the night with me. I had told her about the instances that were happening with me and my sister, but she, like our grandparents, thought that they were a coincidence. She even told me that we were being dramatic. I laughed it off and we continued with our plans for the night. Dinner, gravel traveling, and reading in bed before we fall asleep. My wife liked to sleep on the side of the bed next to the window in my room. She would always crack the window just a little bit so she could feel the breeze come in from the backyard. It had rained earlier in the day and we had some really great breeze rolling through that night. Before we went to bed, she walked to the window to crack it and I begged her not to. She and I went back and forth about it for a little while and she eventually relented and agreed to turn the fan on instead. We settled into bed so that I could read her some articles and I fell asleep shortly after. The next thing I remember is hearing my wife yell at me to wake up now. After I fell asleep, my wife took the opportunity to crack the windows anyway. Once she fell asleep, she found herself waking up for no discernible reason. She decided that she must have to use the bathroom and walk down the hallway. Upon returning to the bedroom, she saw a shadow move outside the bedroom window through the curtain. She stood stock still for a minute, paralyzed, and it didn't move, so she crawled back into bed. She leaned in and kissed my cheek before turning to face the window, where she saw a man staring directly at her through the open part of the window. He was tall, well-built, and wearing a baseball cap. She jumped up immediately to slam the window shut and started yelling at me to get up. Suddenly, my sister burst into my bedroom. Yelling Diesel was growling at the window again. I heard footsteps. What did you see? We sat up together for a while, making our plans to tell Grandma and Grandpa in the morning, before we went back to bed in the early hours of the morning. When we woke up, we told my Grandpa what had happened. When he looked around the house, he found footsteps leading to both our windows in the backyard. He freaked out and told my Grandma and said he was calling the police. My Grandma told him not to bother because none of us had a detailed description so the police wouldn't be able to do anything. He was probably just a peeping Tom anyways, which was harmless. She had a peeping Tom as a little girl. We should just make sure that we're not naked or otherwise indecent in front of any windows with open curtains. They argued for a little bit and Grandpa finally agreed with my Grandma. He told the three of us girls, though, that we're not to leave the house alone for any reason after dark. He'd wait up until each of us got there if we were working late. Life went on. There wasn't any more activity and we figured that whoever had been watching us had moved on. We were still following Grandpa's instructions, but as young 20-somethings, it started to feel less urgent as the days went on without any happenings. We were feeling secure and safe, though we weren't. Ten days after my wife saw the man peeking in through the window, my sister and I were up late doing college homework together. We each had assignments due online at midnight and were scrambling to finish them. I submitted mine at 11.50, my sister hers a few minutes later, and we decided we were hungry. We didn't have any junk food in the house, so we decided to go to McDonald's. We got the dog, got in the car, blared our music, and left. We were having a good time driving through town, listening to our pumped up music and stuffing our faces, but we knew we needed to get home for class in the morning. Instead of driving around to finish our music, we decided to go home directly and pull into the driveway while our song was finishing up. We were gone for a total of 20 minutes and we sat in the driveway for about 3. We got out of the car to come up the long driveway, no care in the world besides getting to bed and start walking leisurely, joking and singing. Suddenly I heard a crunching noise, like someone stepping on a leaf. Diesel suddenly jumped behind us and started snarling. I remember hearing my sister scream run as we started sprinting up the driveway. 
We could hear the footsteps of someone running behind us, and I just knew it was the dude that had been watching us. I knew that he was going to catch us and hurt us, and all because we had been careless to leave the house so late at night for a burger. We got almost on the landing of the stairs, and my sister shouted the dog's name. He came running up and ran into the house right behind us, where we locked the doors. We never looked back to see who was chasing us, but we both agreed it must have been the man who had been watching us. We started trying to catch our breath. Diesel was not trying to catch his breath, though. He kept running to the living room window, watching and growling. Then he'd run to us and just look, for just a second, like he was making sure we were okay. Then he'd run back to the living room window and growl again. As soon as she caught her breath, my sister went to wake my grandpa. The dog stopped growling. We called the police and told them what happened, and they agreed to patrol the area. They never did find him, but we never saw or heard from him again. It still makes my skin crawl to think of what would have happened to my sister and I if her dog hadn't rushed to our protection, and what would have happened to my wife and I if she hadn't noticed him peeking under the open window. I'm just happy that we're all unhurt. From March to May of 2017, I toured Europe with my mom and sister. I was 16 at the time and were Australian. I'm the classic stereotypical Aussie teenage girl. Blonde, blue-green eyes, tan. I'd say I look average if it matters. Our trip, of course, happened to collide with all of the terrorist attacks. We drove down the Westminster Bridge the week after the attack, saw all the memorials, we visited the Louvre a month after the machete attacks. We boarded the subway the day before a bomb was left on it, and we'd taken the exact same route at the same time. We were in the Versailles Palace when a bomb threat occurred. We were in Manchester when the concert attack happened. You get the gist. Due to this, we were all on very high alert for the entirety of our trip. I think that explains my behavior in this story. So our trip mostly consisted of us staying in a hotel, apartment, or lodge for two or three days, then driving on to the next place. I can't remember where this particular hotel was, and it's important to know that I'm a very go-with-the-flow person, so I didn't know where we were. I didn't care if it was an apartment or hotel, I just knew that on that particular day I was sick, and I decided to stay in instead of go out into the freezing cold and get sicker. So my sister and my mom went on without me. About ten minutes after they left, I heard the door open. I'd been watching a movie on my laptop and didn't pay much attention to it. I figured maybe my mom had forgotten something and come back for it, although the time lapse seemed a little long for that. It still seemed like the most likely thing. But she didn't call out to me. I wondered if she thought I might be asleep or if it was a maid service. Usually they call out, hello, anybody in here, when they enter, but maybe they figured we were already gone. I waited, getting more and more concerned with every passing minute. I wasn't on high alert, but I already am a very paranoid person by nature, and although I tend to diminish my own paranoia, in the moment all I was thinking is, oh my god, you're so pathetic, do you really think a robbery or something would take place with you in the room? I also admittedly succumbed to that paranoia a lot. I figured it was most likely a landlord, if it wasn't a maid service. Again, I didn't know if we were in a hotel or an apartment complex, so I did what any antisocial, anxiety-ridden, paranoid, victim-of-assault teenage girl would do and hid in the closet. Even at the time, digging myself beneath the bundles of blankets that they had shoved in there, I thought I was ridiculous. So ridiculous, in fact, that I took a Snapchat of myself in the closet with a caption along the lines of, is it a robber or the maid service in my room, a day in the life of my name. My friends thought I was an idiot, and I remember one messaging me and laughing about, oh, maybe it's another terrorist attack, but I didn't answer her. I was too focused on trying to figure out what the person who'd come in was doing. It sounded like they were going from room to room, raiding the place. I heard things being moved around and not in the way that they would be if someone was trying to clean underneath them or something. It was very rough. 
I heard doors open and close again and again. They even came into the room I was in and rummaged around for a while. I honestly don't know if they looked into the closet. I'd left the door open a bit, enough for them to peer into, because it had caught on to something and closing it would have caused more noise, but I was hidden behind bundles and bundles of thick blankets. I'm a girl of very small stature, so I wouldn't have been noticed. Finally, it sounded like they left. I say they because I strongly suspect that there were two people. The footsteps and movements didn't really match up to just one person, but I thought it was most likely my mom and that I was just paranoid and hallucinating. I waited a good 15 minutes after they left before I climbed out of my hiding spot. I was pretty unnerved, but I came out and checked on our suitcases. We had left them open in the living room, barring our money and passports for all to see. Nothing looked disturbed, except the passports. My mom keeps all our passports in a Ziploc bag. The Ziploc bag had been opened and the two passports had been pulled out. One was half in the Ziploc bag, like they'd opened it enough to check to see who it was and then ignored it. The second was left on top of the clothes. Someone had picked it up and looked through it. I opened it and it was mine. My mother came home several hours later and I asked her if she'd come back about ten minutes after leaving, if she'd come back to get something she forgot. She looked perplexed and said no, and I was honestly shocked. I asked if we were in a hotel with a maid service or if she had called the maintenance man to come by and forgotten to tell me. She started looking suspicious and said no and asked me why. I asked her if we had a landlord that might have come by. She said no. It hit me in that moment that an honest-to-God stranger had been in my hotel room while I was there. Still, it didn't feel like a big deal. Maybe they gave someone the wrong key card and they didn't realize until they went through the rooms and looked through our passports to see who was staying in the room. After all, nothing had been taken. I decided to go with my mother for the rest of the day, still unnerved about the experience. We were in the town chatting with some locals who asked where we were staying. We told them and they looked horrified. I wasn't there for the conversation, but according to my mother, they told her, I don't want to frighten you, but I think you should leave that place immediately. We here have a suspicion that they're trafficking girls into different trades. A lot of backpackers go missing after visiting there. We left that day and my mother didn't tell me the reason until we were in the car. For someone to have gotten into my room, they would have needed to be allowed into the main doors by an employee or have a keycard themselves to have access. Then they would have needed to have a keycard to my room. I also suspect that maybe someone was watching on the CCTV cameras and saw my mom and sister leave and realized that I wasn't with them. It gives me chills to think about, but it never really hit me, considering even in the amount of time I've kept thinking I was the biggest idiot in the world for hiding in a closet because I was scared of socializing with a maid service. But I think the fact that I kept thinking I was so dumb and paranoid and dramatic for it all throughout the experience might have saved me. It meant I kept a level head and listened for clues, that I didn't have adrenaline pumping through my veins and clouding my thoughts. I work at a grocery store as a cashier and I've met so many different types of people that I'd rather not meet again, but this one takes the cake for sure. The store I work at is open 24 hours and this was one of the first few times I had to work the night shift. Most people don't go grocery shopping past 10pm, so Night shifts are usually just one cashier and one manager or supervisor. My manager was in her office and I was just on my phone trying my best to stay awake. Since I don't usually work night shifts, I was struggling a little bit once it hit about 12.30am. It wasn't busy and the parking lot was empty except for my car, my manager's car and another car sitting by the line of shopping carts. The car was running with the headlights off but with the interior lights on and a fairly large bald dude sitting hunched over with his hands firmly holding the top of the steering wheel and staring inside the store. I was very startled by this because of how eerie and creepy it felt. 
After a few seconds of me staring back at him, he turned his car off in the interior lights and got out of the car. He started walking around to grab a cart. I wrote it off as maybe he didn't know we were 24 hours and was trying to read the sign on the door. I ignore the fact that he would have needed his headlights on to read it. He came into the store and started scanning the aisles. I went back on my phone because it was just an average Joe, then I didn't want to make him uncomfortable. About 15 or 20 minutes go by and he comes up to the checkout with a cart full, and I mean full, of jars of mayonnaise and a singular vegetable platter. This was just so confusing, but I tried not to be judgmental. He took a little while to start unloading the cart because he was scanning the magazine racks that most registers have right there at a checkout. We grabbed one of those teen celebrity magazines like Seventeen or J14 or something, which didn't help his creep factor. He started unloading the cart and I scanned the jars as soon as they came up so that this would go as fast as possible. He greeted me with a, hi, how are you, young lady? but in a Daffy Duck impression. I was so confused and creeped out, but I just said that I was well and asked him how he was. He responded with, I'm just so dandy on this fine evening in the same Daffy Duck voice. I was beginning to get more scared rather than creeped out. I ignored it and asked him if he had a rewards card for our store. He said no in a normal voice. I told him the price of his transaction and he fumbled around in his pockets for his wallet. He asked me if I liked his impression and if it was good. Honestly, the impression was pretty spot on, which is why it was freaking me out so much. I told him that it was good trying to stay polite and calm. He handed me some cash and I opened the register to get his change. As I was handing him his change, he held on to my hand and leaned over the credit card machine. He asked me if I've ever been to a party with that much mayonnaise. I said no and pulled my hand away, which he reluctantly let go of. He was still leaning over the credit card machine and said, Well, I won't get into too much detail, but the mayonnaise is not for veggies. He winked and put his change in his wallet and began taking his grocery bags and putting them in his cart. He began acting like he was in pain and asked me to help him put the bags in his car. I was not about to do that because this guy was beyond creepy. I told him that I wasn't allowed to leave the register because I was the only one working. He tried to push it but I told him again that I was not allowed to leave the register. I don't know if that was actually a rule but neither did he so I used it as an excuse not to go with him anyway. He gave me a puppy dog face and pleaded with his hands and... I told him once again that I was not allowed to leave and that if he didn't stop, I would call my manager down. He stopped immediately, scoffed at me, and left without saying another word. He loaded his car and left the cart in the parking lot, enough though the line of carts was right next to his car, like literally three feet away. I'm assuming he probably wanted to see if I would come out and put it back, but I wasn't going out there. He got in his car, turned it on, and resumed the same position that he had been in before he came in. I called my manager down after like three minutes of him just sitting there again, just like before, because it was really scaring me at this point. She came down and looked out the window at him, and he drove away. I told her everything that happened, and she said that I was in the right by not going with him, and that if I saw him again, to call the police. Apparently this wasn't the first time he'd done something like this during the night shift to a couple of other female co-workers. Needless to say, I made sure I never had another night shift again after that. For some backstory, I'm female, 18 now. I was 13 when this encounter happened. This might be kind of long, but bear with me. This encounter happened around 2013, and I was a part of this girls-only group. We'd meet up every week and just hang out and do teenage things. There were different locations around my city, and I obviously went to one closest to me. It was about a 10-minute drive from my house. The building where we met was at a massive local park near a lake, which made for plenty of fun times. The group was for girls aged 13 to 17, so we generally all got along well. 
The particular group that I was in met on Thursday nights and there was nine of us. Two were my family friends who were also my lifelong best friends. Them and two other girls and I went to the same school. There was this camp every year. The goal was to do everything yourself. So we had to set up our own campsite, make all our dinners, etc. It was really fun. I had been two times previously. It's a competition and our group split into two. Me, Aaron, Izzy and Jess. The other five girls were in another group. One thing we had to do to prepare was to go shopping for food, so we did that one night and spend the other few nights packing everything we would need like tents, portable stove, stuff for a fire, etc. My friend Aaron and I were in the same class at high school, so the Friday afternoon of the camp we left early and her mom picked us up. We live in the same street so we got our things and carpooled there with the other girls, Izzy and Jess. The park where all the camps were was massive. We stopped for pizza along the way. The first few nights of the camp went well. We stayed up all night eating candy in our tent, sneaking out and walking around the massive park, talking, playing truth or dare, and never have I ever, you know, normal teenage girl things. On the last full day, we did an activity that we chose prior to going to camp. Out of all the girls in my group, I was the only one who had chosen to do archery, and I only knew two other girls from my main group, and I got to know some of the other girls I didn't know from the other groups. During the activity, the leaders started acting weird. They were looking at each other, whispering and talking on their walkie-talkies. The girls I knew from our group back at home who weren't in my group at the camp were doing archery too, so I hung around with them and we were discussing why we thought the leaders were being this way. The leaders seemed to get more scared every minute, and they called us all over and told us to go into one of the buildings because we were going on lockdown. I stuck with the girls and me and some other activity groups went inside. Everyone else from the other activity groups went to the building on the other side of the park, including the girls from my group at this camp. We hung out there chatting with everyone for maybe an hour and we talked about the camp so far and then about what we thought was going on. This one girl named Chloe said that a girl had seen a naked man with a knife walking around in the woods, and another girl named Monique said that there were a gang in the woods who knew of the girl's camp and wanted to find someone to snatch up. We were all freaked out either way. Then they offered bathroom breaks. We went into groups of four outside of the bathrooms and two leaders escorted us. There were two cop cars outside and I felt really uneasy. We started to talk amongst ourselves, but the leaders led us to the bathrooms and told us to keep shush. When we got into the bathroom, they explained everything. A girl in the orienteering group, her name was Piper, had spotted a naked man holding a knife, so Chloe was correct. They told us it was all going to be okay and that the cops were searching. They called everyone's parents and the police finished their search. When this was done, one of the cops came into our building and said they got the guy and we were all safe. We were let back to our campsites and when I saw my friends from the other buildings back at the tent, I hugged them and they asked if I was okay and I asked them the same. Fortunately, no one was hurt, but the girl who saw the man, Piper, went home and was obviously traumatized. We were supposed to cook our own dinners that night on the fire, but to celebrate the leaders ordered a ton of pizza, soda, and fries for us just to have a massive feast. We were all incredibly scared that night and we didn't sneak out of our tent like we had the other nights. Even though the guy had been arrested, we were all still creeped out. The next year, there was this girl in my class named Hannah. I found out she was part of the same girls club I was, but from another location in my city. I slightly recognized her after she told me this. I brought up the incident at the camp from the previous year and she was at the camp too. She was part of the orienteering group that saw the guy. She told me that indeed he was naked and had a knife. I'm guessing he was on something, but either way, it was creepy.